Loretta, thank you so much for joining us here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's so great to see you. Hi, it's great to be here. Yes, and Richard here. So uh, it's really wonderful. We we came upon upon your your wonderful book, and then looked at all this fabulous stuff, websites, and and the things that you've been doing for for quite some time. And we've we've said a few things about you, but how about you just uh, fill us in with some of your own story of yourself and and just how this book uh, uh, this book came about. Sure. Um, So I grew up around a lot of unhappiness and I was trying to figure out all the time, what is everybody so upset about? Because it wasn't anything that you could really put your finger on. And sometimes the blame settled on me. So imagine how motivated I was to (laughs) figure out, you know, what's, what's the problem? And so I was interested in psychology when I read that it was a real formal study and you were allowed to talk about people's emotions rather than just fearing, you know, what might explode. Um, But I was never attracted to it as a career because I had really heard enough of other people's problems when I was growing up. (laughs) So um, in a way that was very good for me because I got to sample all different disciplines within psychology rather than being forced into one paradigm to keep up my credentials. And so I had a 25 year career teaching management and I was able to take early retirement. And um, at at that point, my baby left for college and I had had a lot of life experience. And I sort of felt that the social science model did not explain my students or my children. Um, The social science model to me was that if you're just nice to everybody, then they'll all do the right thing. And I tried that and it didn't work. Um, so that's why I was open to new stuff. And one of the things that I discovered was evolutionary psychology, which did not exist when I was in college in the dark ages. So I started reading a lot about monkeys and one little monkey study here mentioned a chemical and another little monkey study there mentioned another chemical and no one had connected the dots. So that's the simple answer of how I got started. <laughs> and I think what is exciting about what you're doing, what a lot of other people are doing, is uh, that we're going to look at the lived experience as the as the essential framework. <clears throat> then I'm going to look for things that help me understand the lived experience. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit in a lab, find out what does people do, things do in a lab, and then tell people that's how they should live. And yes. this is a big movement at the moment. Actually, we just had uh, our major scientific awards, uh, the finalists. One of them is a purely lived experience-based uh, oh, study okay. on uh, handicapped, and so they're working with handicapped uh, uh, people as the central elements. So this is what you were looking at, uh, this idea of, yeah, 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 there's all this information, but I'm trying to understand these actual people. This is, you know, my students and mm. my family. Mm. Mm. And and that interesting thing that you said back there, if also I could just sort of throw in for the for the for your continuing comments among those things was, uh, and that there was a tendency for people to blame other people. That you copped a lot of the blame for their their unhappiness. It's sort of like like not wanting to be my fault. Can, just can you just sort of uh, tell us a bit more about those thoughts and motivations that you had in writing? Sure. Well, we all know <laughs> that um, this. A common response of you made me mad, you upset me. And I heard that a lot from my mother. Uh, she was she pointed blame in many directions other than herself, of course. Yeah. And um, after she was gone and I gained some adult perspective, I realized that she had a really, really bad situation when she was young and that wired her, and she was projecting that onto her current reality, and that's how the brain works. And I wish I had understood it, you know, when I was young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, this is, is, as a grandfather, I I, I keep thinking to myself, if only I'd known that my daughter would be so much happier, but my granddaughter's happy now, so that's good. Now, my daughter's good, but it but this this thing of of uh, and of course in psychotherapy and psychoanalytical thing they talk about transference counter transference mm-hmm. and projection mm-hmm. and all that stuff. But this this um, social activity of of 
pushing outside of ourselves for, for causes to our misery rather than working what's inside of ourselves. I think what you're doing is part of what will help help, help us understand this is I don't understand what's going on inside me, yes. but I can see somebody saying something that I don't like. So this is what you endeavour to do in this book, uh, uh, is, is yeah. you know, our take of it, that, that you're yeah, trying to help people you. understand what's well, in Well, you asked you ask me where my motivation started, and that's it. But as you know, people really don't like one bit to be told that they're creating it themselves. So I presented it in a more, let's say, positive and hopeful frame, which is you can stimulate more of the happy chemicals if you understand the old wiring. And this offers people an alternative to the uh, explanatory framework that our inner mammal creates. And in my new video series, I'm sort of taking this perspective of, we have two brains, they don't always get along, but we can train them to get along like a horse and rider, and a skillful horse and rider can get more done, but it's very hard to do because your um, first, uh, your uh, human brain uses language. So you think your inner voice is the whole story and your mammal brain releases chemicals, but you're not aware of these responses or the old pathways that control them. And because you're not aware of that, your your human brain tries to help by coming up with some logical explanation that makes you look good. And I call that your internal public relations agency. <laughs> and, and that's what I love about the way you've written this too, is the, the language you use is very accessible. Of course, you've written this for the general public. And as a clinician, there is so much that we can uh, adopt um, from the way that you've explained things. So um, I'd love to dive into some of the aspects of the book. Um, so just the, the the sort of the subtitle here is retrain your brain to boost your serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, and endorphin levels. Now, it sounds very scientific, but um, it's very, very pragmatic as well. So um, where should we start? Well, I, I don't know we've, because we've got uh, the we talk about the inner mammal. We're just briefly there with the, that aspect, and that was very, uh, very simple but very succinct. Uh, and, and you just really jump into the the. There's two sides. You talk about the happy chemicals in uh, in, in chapter two, and then also later on you talk about um, why we why we move into unhappiness. What what is the what is the the, the framework? And and this idea that there's ways in which we can we can stimulate ourselves or shift ourselves from one to the other. So maybe if we just start in there, you know, uh, meet your happy chemicals. So the bottom line, of course, is that our emotions, our chemicals are controlled by brain structures that we've inherited from earlier animals. And anytime you're doing anything that an animal could do, then your mammal brain can control that, your limbic system. So it creates, uh, it releases a good feeling chemical in a moment where the appropriate behavior is to move forward towards something that meets a need. So a good feeling exists for a reason, not for you to sit around on the couch feeling good, but to motivate you in, when it's appropriate to move forward to meet a need. And when I say appropriate, I mean that it helps you meet your needs. Now, a bad feeling chemical is released when the survival behavior is to move back from a threat. So it's sort of like it, your natural GPS that you're always getting chemicals to either move forward or pull back. That's all their function. So people always want to put some kind of virtuous, you know, higher morality to them, but this is their core um, function in animals. So each one has a different function, which is why we so urgently want all of them. So dopamine is the core, it's the good feeling that a need is about to be met. So the classic example is you're about to reach the finish line in a marathon, but how did you get there is all the training you did and you did the training because little drips of dopamine were released when you anticipate a reward. So for one person, they think, oh, I'll be so happy if I finish a marathon that they perceive that training as approaching a reward. Whereas other people like me think, well, I don't really care if I cross that line or not. So I would have like 
writing a book to me is like, I'm so excited that I can't wait to go back and sit down at my desk and get closer to that reward, which other people might hate. So it's very individual because we're all wired by our past dopamine, starting from that newborn who doesn't know what milk is, but when milk appears, then that meets a need, dopamine's released and wires them to then start getting excited in advance when they hear their mother's footsteps. So it's just layer on layer of past rewards. So if we move on to oxytocin, uh, oxytocin is the good feeling of social support. And this is the sort of the warm and fuzzy thing that we mostly hear about in the media as the path to happiness. But the reality is that animals, although they seek a herd or a group when they're threatened by predators, that they prefer, prefer to disperse when they're safe, because that avoids conflict over food. So the animal brain is constantly choosing when is a better moment to return to the herd and when is a better moment to seek greener pasture. So we are always making that decision too, but we sort of want both, you know, we get frustrated that we have to choose. Now, um, because of when you don't have a herd, when you don't have social support, then it's a high priority and Oxytocin is very motivating for you to do things that build social bonds so you can get it. But then we all know that the minute you have a herd, then you get annoyed with them, right? And like nobody likes to admit that, but it's so easy to see. So that's why I like to point out that the real mammalian urge is for protection. And that's an inherently uh, selfish need. I want you to protect me. I'm running to the herd so that the predator gets you rather than me. <laughs> so um, that's why a lot of this behavior is confusing and doesn't make sense. And a simple example would be people might go to a giant stadium to be with like 10,000 other people who share their love of a sport or a singer because we really are so frustrated with our herds in reality that we construct illusory ways of having, of like creating that feeling of being in a big herd. But the minute you leave that stadium, they're not going to be there for you. So, so we're better off understanding this impulse rather than sort of the internet wisdom of, you know, you should be with your pals all the time, which just leads you to go to the pub every night. No, it's really nice. I just, because uh, I just quickly, the, the uh, in there in a comment, we, we had a commercial recently for a mobile phone. And what it did was it, it advertised the mobile phone with everybody sitting together. Uh, so, so it was sort of like, here's your herd. And so it was, it was tapping into that sort of uh, instinct that you're talking about. You can have your herd, um, but you must have a mobile phone, which of course is stupid because if you're sitting next to people, you don't need your mobile phone. But but how interesting that they were tapping into this same yeah, um, that's psych psychology that you're talking about. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So serotonin, mm. this is the complex one uh, because we've all heard uh, the concept of SSRIs reducing depression through serotonin. Um, but Back in the 70s and 80s, there was monkey research that showed that the animal who gains that social dominance moment has a spurt of serotonin. And this is uncomfortable. We don't like to think this, but in fact, there was a whole century of research that showed that animals, mammals have social hierarchies and they invest tremendous energy and effort into raising their position in the social hierarchy because it promotes reproductive success. So this did not please the gods of academia. And so we didn't hear very much of this and it soon disappeared. And so imagine how stunned I was when I stumbled on this and I thought, well, doesn't that explain everything that frustrates us in daily life? So you get a little serotonin burst when you have a moment of social dominance. And rather than um, putting it in an uncomfortable way, let's just say that if you're playing cards and you draw just the card you need and you're like, wow, I'm going to win. So it's a universal pleasure of winning. and. 
we all know that that exists. It's just taboo to talk about it. So we only see it in others and we only see it in the context of societal evils rather. But if you see it in yourself, then you see why. Um, uh, oh, and uh, David Attenborough helped me tremendously in understanding this because I would see in his nature videos that a little monkey who reaches for a banana near a bigger monkey is going to get bitten. So the little monkey pulls back, which is cortisol, and they do the social comparison thing. And then they wait until they have a chance to be in the one up position. Serotonin is released. D David Attenborough didn't say that part. He said all the rest. Uh, when they're in the one-up position, then they reach for the banana. And you can see why everyone is always making social comparisons and longing for that moment when they're in the one-up position so that they can get the banana or the mating opportunity, which keeps their genes alive. And when I saw that in, in a nature video, and I thought, Everybody knows this enough to put it in a video from 10, 20 years ago, but you're not allowed to know it. So. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you, you, you say that uh, serotonin is security of social importance, which I think is a uh, very succinct way of putting it. And we have chickens. And I tell you, there is such a hierarchy with chickens and they are always squabbling to maintain that hierarchy. So that's got to be the serotonin in play there, right? Yes, exactly. And the interesting thing is that, um, so I, I've heard a lot of, of fascinating chicken examples. Somehow people maybe are more willing to admit that this is going on when it's not mammals. So the smaller the animal's brain, the less, the fewer neurons it has to update the hierarchy. So mm. it, it sustains the same hierarchy for a long time and only updates it when the so the, the hierarchy changes because the leader leaves or is killed. Uh, or if the group size exceeds the, the quantity of their brain, and then they break into two hierarchies. But the bottom line is everyone has to fight everyone else again, and then they record the results, and then they stick with that hierarchy until there's some upheaval. But monkeys are constantly scheming for how can I get ahead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and it's interesting. And this, this of course, creates a, a, a fascinating complication or complex situation in humans because because we have not only uh, sort of our genetic and our, our instincts and our behavioural frames, but we actually have this cognitive capacity to construct uh, and cognitively create hierarchies and social structures and of course this is this effort now to to balance out the, the scales of who is determined to be uh, what what the hierarchy is to level the playing field a lot uh, i mean we, we've got massive talks about the, you know about patriarchy and, and of course raising up minorities or, or that they were considered minorities it's so interesting yeah do you do you find that obviously with bigger brains, I mean, as much as we try to impose our sense of fairness on our chickens, it doesn't work. <laughs> but, but but hopefully with our bigger brains, that we're able to cognitively <laughs> override maybe some of those, um, uh, you know, more harmful hierarchical um, motivations that we have. Uh, yes and no. Um, so I have a new book called Status Games. Uh, you know, there's this cliche about if women ran the world, blah, blah, blah. But um, there's an impulse to um, cherry pick the evidence uh, when, in fact, women have plenty of conflict between them. And so I go through all of the female led species and show the terrible viciousness <laughs> that raises one status within those species. So oh, yeah. um, where there's a bit of filtering of information going on in, in every time period, in every culture. Uh, so I think that um, fortunately, there's less violent quibbling uh, as much as people don't maybe notice that. But the quibbling is still quite endlessness. And I use a simple example that if Bill Gates wears the same sneakers that I wear, so then that won't make anybody happy. That just drives people to resent something else about the status hierarchy. 
Right. So right. interesting. Mm. So here we are. We, we, we have, now you, you mentioned cortisol uh, in, in amongst the, when, when the, 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 the situations are going, we've got oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine, and, but, but this cortisol, that's the, that's the shift. Is it that, that changes you into a different frame? Is that uh, what you're describing there? Uh, so cortisol is the brain's alert that there's a potential threat to your survival. And your conscious brain is not necessarily seeing it as a threat to your survival because even an obstacle, even a bad hair day is a threat to your survival from a mammal brain's perspective because it could potentially interfere with your reproductive success, even if you're infertile because of connections made in your past. So once a negative feeling, a cortisol alert, happens because you see something similar to a cortisol alert in your past. So that turns it on. It tells your cortex to look for more evidence of threat. And we're very good at finding the evidence when we look. So cortisol makes you feel like you will die unless you make it stop. So how do you make it stop? So whatever made it stop in your past. So for example, if you played video games when you were young, or if you ate pizza when you were young, and that distracted you from uh, distressing thoughts, then that worked. So that's what I mean by shifting from a negative focus to a positive focus. It's not logical, it's not necessarily fixing the underlying problem, but it works from your mammal brain's perspective. And of course, these things, we can take these to extremes and we get addictions and all sorts of things to try and maintain a sense of yeah happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so can I say something about addiction? So that's like one more layer of um, what people have probably heard is that you get an extra large dopamine surge when you get an extra large reward. So our brain habituates to the rewards that we already have. And we're always looking for the super duper extra special reward. And um, drugs, for example, are by definition more than a natural level of reward. So anytime you get a, an above more than the level of reward that you could get naturally, that builds a huge circuit and that tells your dopamine like, wow, this is the way to go. Yes, I mean this is the thing that that we've we've learned, uh, uh, and I sort of noticed a great deal in my studies was it was actually the receptors that we needed to pay attention. Certainly, there's the 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 the, the chemicals themselves, but it's also the numbers and the way in which they're received. And of course, you get these false um, surges, as you said, from from, from drugs and various different uh, different uh, motivations, and also thrill seekers get this as well uh, in in what they're doing, and that means that our the receptors change their uh, their numbers and change the, the way in which they receive and so consequently that's why the ordinary uh, dosage of dopamine that comes isn't enough because of that so it's it's quite as you said it's quite a system um uh, it's not just a matter it, it's it's what's sent what's received and then what's done with it and and also what parts of the brain get used to responding to i suppose mm. uh would be uh, would also uh, and builds up and that's, well as you said um that's what you build up with your experience over time so I focus a lot on pathways, on the neural pathways built from experience. Mm. And I explain that neural pathways build from, in three ways, um, emotion, um, repetition, and youth. So emotion is like whenever you have a good feeling or a bad feeling, you could think of that as paving on your neural pathway because emotions are your brain signal that this is worth remembering. This is relevant to your survival, whether pro or con. So repetition builds neural pathways. Um, we can easily see that, like if you're trying to memorize a phone number. And youth is when myelin is abundant. And that the myelinated pathways are up to 100 times better at um, conducting electricity. And that's why we rely so heavily. And that's why it's so easy to speak your native language and so hard to learn a foreign language in adulthood. So you put these all together and whatever you do with your existing neural pathways feels natural and normal. So that's why we tend to repeat behaviors that turned on our happy chemicals in the past and why it's so hard to turn them on in new ways. 
Yeah. Yeah, and and you say uh, uh, um, there's two sides of the stick. One's that, one is just that that the uh, behaviours that stimulated good things we we repeat those to get those good things to happen, but behaviours that don't we we have linkages too. And you put it so nicely that um, we link what is what is bad to what happens just before. Um, so suddenly you get these 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 hard uh, the, or these not hardwired, but these very strongly em- empowered things for and I, I suppose one of the terms we use is triggers. Uh, so yes. so what's what's that about? Uh, what's what's happening there? Sure. So in the animal world, um, the the classic example, like let's say a monkey is in the top of a tree and a hawk comes down and grabs it and puts its claws in it. And that's pain is a big surge of cortisol. Cortisol wires every, all the neurons active at that moment, but we have a sort of a buffer memory. So even neurons activated 30 seconds ago are still active. So what happened 30 seconds ago is the hawk blocked out the light overhead. So all I need is that moment of darkness to activate me like, whoa, something bad's going to happen. Yeah. Wow. No, it's, I mean, I mean, it just reminds me because in phobias, you get this sort of thing where, yeah, where exactly. it seems dissociated. And there's this wonderful case of, of the chap who was afraid, who couldn't wear a belt. He, so he had to wear, um, uh, you know, sort of braces on his, on his trousers and all those sorts of things. And they finally got back to it that when he was a, a very young child, they had a had a very playful, great relationship with the, with a dog. But the dog would um, would play with him. But sometimes he would sort of get on top, and he would sort of be smothered a little bit. And of course, right in front of his eyes was the leather collar. And over time, that was forgotten as a memory, but it just got translated into exactly. this uh, leather. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so yes. suddenly you've got these what seem to be um, odd behaviours or odd relationships, odd triggers, but mm-hmm. that's what you need to go back to to find out. Um, that's what we're finding when we find the moment, the event of the trauma, but what was going on just before? How interesting. Yeah. 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 So understanding some of the mechanisms and, and these chemicals, let's move on to creating some healthy habits. Now you've got a certain time frame that you talk about uh, when it comes to creating habits. So let's get into the pragmatics of how we can change things. Good. So I t- the book is based on a 45-day model. If you repeat a new behavior for 48, 45 days without fail, you'll build a new pathway. Now, I can't actually point to data on that because I heard this from a yoga teacher who I thought was reliable. And then, you know, pe- you know how people like insist on their data. And then when I looked for it, I couldn't find it. So the next editor said, oh, we'll just leave it out. But then I got feedback from readers who said, no, I like the 45 days because I really needed to have that. So it is giving you that excitement of approaching a goal, but with the caveat that on day 46, you still need to do it. The point is that it should be easier on day 46. But my focus is on the fact that you have to do it 45 days without fail. And you have to start over if you don't do it. Because the minute you tell yourself, "Ah, I could skip a day, then you're building the circuit that says, oh, it's fine to skip a day. And then you're going to just skip another day and another. Actually, and actually, there's there is quite a lot of stuff uh, uh, research on this. It's a it's about the the, the nature of construction of neural pathways, mm-hmm. and um, so what what you have is you is when you and so that's the building of new synapses, new synaptic connections, mm-hmm. uh, so new axons uh, or new dendrites and things. And it actually, it starts it it starts can they start very quickly? Can start within within ninety minutes, uh, which is really good little bumps, but it is six to twelve weeks. Uh, and this is why cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, their programs are six to 12 weeks long. So, you know, that's your 40, that's your 42 days. And what I think is really important is what you've added there is saying, but consistently. Um, so if you break and the, the, the way we, the, the, uh, the, the common element and description we use is, is the, the pathway through the grass. 
Um, and uh, what happens is uh, if you take a new pathway, you've still got the old pathway there, the new pathway, it takes a while. If you keep go, if you go back to the old pathway, of course, the new pathway is not going to firm up. It's a bit simplistic. But um, no, I, uh, uh, it, it is quite strong, the, the literature, mm. um, but it's a little bit obscure in some of the places. So it's not uh, readily sort of thing you find. Yeah, so, so I too well resonate. Done with that that sort of 40 the 40 day kind of ballpark figure as well and not just um from the nervous system perspective but from the soma the whole body as well and again i can't put my finger on any any study but i've you know heard oh, this. not off the top of their head but there's also yeah. uh, there's also epigenetic processes take um take that so, so there's a there's a long list but certainly this construction and so um but getting people uh, this is part of the thing with, uh, I think, yes. is a frustration, getting yes. them to, to function in that way for 45 days. That's testing. There's a lot of temptation yeah. or motivation or stimulation or triggers. What's going on? Yeah, so it's hard to do that. But my latest focus is how do animal trainers get an animal to repeat a behavior? And the obvious example is with a short-term reward. A short-term reward motivates us to enact the behavior that doesn't reward you until the long run. So I am a big believer in short run rewards. For example, um, uh, people are often told, uh, like people are often told you should reward yourself with a run and a kale salad, but that's not rewarding <laughs> for a lot of people. So it doesn't work. <laughs> I know it's good. I know it's good, but yeah, I just, I just went right off. <laughs> yeah. So the other thing they say, well, extrinsic rewards are bad. You should focus on intrinsic rewards, but most of the things that we find intrinsically rewarding are just things that were extrinsically rewarded in our youth. So I think it's important to learn to use extrinsic rewards creatively and effectively, which means you can't give yourself a cookie every few minutes. So how else can you do this? So I've read a lot of these dog training books and dolphin training books, which fascinating. There's a very, very good writer who invented clicker training that is used to train dolphins to do the triple flips. And so the idea is the reward has to come immediately after the behavior. You have to perceive it as a reward, but a tiny reward is enough, especially if you break a difficult goal into tiny steps and reward yourself with a, a highly valued but tiny reward for each step. You keep triggering dopamine and you keep building the pathway that makes the next step easier. And so like animals, when they're in a training context, they really want to keep doing it because they expect to keep getting rewards and you can manage yourself that way. And and those rewards are also uh, the oxytocin too, I suppose, that I, I, I get uh, that connection and also the endorphins. I, I get the that that puff so you've got and then that all gets connected to to the to the behavior. So we're we've got a lot of habits uh that aren't good for us um, uh, by the sounds of things that that we, we that we need to to break, but for some reason we think they they are good for us. That's a bit of a confusion, isn't it? Like uh, uh, to to fight and battle and and work every you know and and not take any lunch breaks and and all those things. So I get that reward of money at the end of the uh, of the week, but actually that gives you illness and these it's, it's complicated isn't it uh yes it is but i don't think it's really helpful for people to blame their bad habits on society because mm. then they don't take the action that they need i think that the actions are available to us and as long as you have that excuse you don't take them mm. sometimes you have to leave the herd to do what's healthy for yourself and then you have to find an alternative uh, heard that you construct in your mind to feel confidence in your own ability to get support rather than following the herd and then do things that are good for you um, and um, celebrate your ability to do that. And I think one of the big, uh, one of the biggest bad habits, um, because everybody's always focusing on like diet and exercise, I don't think they're the path to happiness because um we need the dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. So if you get them through diet and exercise, good. We need diet and exercise. We need healthy sleep to manufacture 
uh, happy chemicals. But also, like, there's this new trend to say, like, I don't matter. I don't care about myself. I only care about others. And I think that's a real problem because your inner mammal hears, like, you don't care about me. It's never my turn. You're never going to meet my needs. You only care about the needs of others and not me. So I think that also you have to make peace with your inner mammal. That's that's the habit that I'm most focused on. Right, right. That's really interesting. Um, so to make it really concrete, would there be an example that we could pick on for a moment and just sort of step through what the problem is and how we can habitually change it into something more positive. Let's use an example, let's say from my personal experience, if I could go back in time and do a better job. So when I was a worker bee, which I was for most of my life, um, so I would be sitting in meetings and I would get really upset, let's say. So I think everybody can understand that feeling of being upset. It's like your inner mammal is locked in a barn. I think of it that way. Um, and then you walk out of the meeting with that frustrated feeling and then it would continue. So I could go have a run in a kale salad, but you know, then I would go to the next meeting with that same <laughs> bad feeling. So um, I needed to take care of my inner mammal. And first to say, um, first the that immediate shift out of the cortisol, what could I do that's immediately fun and if I don't recognize this need, then I might start shoveling food in my mouth, which is not good. So what else can I do that's fun? So if I listen to comedy on my phone while I'm doing some exercise so that it takes my mind away and gives my mind that immediate release um, and stops reactivating that sort of he said, she said frustration that we tend to do. So that would be the first thing. Then um, why did I feel bad in that meeting? Well, I wasn't, maybe I was telling myself that I was in the one down position. So I needed a way to give myself the one up position. And also maybe when I was in that meeting, I was wishing to have social support and I wasn't. So then I needed to, another way to give myself oxytocin. Now, just blaming and then, Maybe I felt that that meeting was not bringing me closer to my goals, which is the dopamine part. So I needed another way to give myself the feeling of approaching my goals. So if I just blame the people at that meeting, I'm not really, you know, meeting my own needs. So I needed to think more structurally about meeting my own needs. Almost using the, the, the negative feeling as a stimulation to have positive feelings. So it, that's, that's a, that would be terrific if, uh, uh, you know, I know I talk about this a bit with my curiosity sort of work I do and, and I had to sort of say, okay, what can I learn from this? Uh, that, was, that was just a, such a simple example. Lovely. And, and some creative reframing of mm, the situation mm. that you find yourself in, right? But, but consistently yeah. maintaining that reframe. <laughs> like well, said, and in reality, um, uh, you know, I think I was doing the right thing by biting my tongue at these meetings right. and just getting out of there as fast as I could and putting my energy into other aspects of life. Because you know how like in these meetings, they just debate minutia forever because everybody in the meeting wants to get their little serotonin <laughs> Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that thing that sometimes, so that need to to move away from the herd, that 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 private time, that personal time, mm, 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 is the time when you can consider and and um and and Im implement those things into your life. Uh, uh, we were actually just talking about some something very simple, doing a little project, and uh, for someone, and and exactly that, we had half a dozen people in the meeting. They all had ideas to improve the the, the project. But the end result was, uh, you know, Matt had to go off and 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 actually work all those things out, and the staying in the meeting was just delaying it. So sometimes this yeah, yeah, importance yeah. of indiv of the individualism, the the individual um, frame of of self reflection and self uh, uh, self improvement um, hmm. is re is really important, yeah, and that's the serotonin thing. And then then you go back and. 
uh, yeah, you feel better in yourself, which of course is a part of the hierarchical you know, development anyway. And it wasn't, excuse me for saying, it wasn't really self-improvement. I wasn't finding fault with myself, but I was basically addressing that, like, I better focus on my needs rather than just being mad at other people for not yeah. meeting my needs. Yeah. 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 I guess I, I, I consider anything where you improve your thinking as an improvement. But uh, yes, I know that, that self-improvement has this sort of tag of being uh, it's been tagged by coaches and stuff, but they're quite right. Yeah. So just getting a better grasp and a better understanding of yourself. Yeah. Cool. Now, one of the one of the wonderful things um, is that we don't need anything. We've already got everything we need to create these changes. There's nothing external that we need um, to spend money on or mm. anything like that, or except for maybe buying your book. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so did you want to just sort of add to that thought? Sure. So many people think, well, how can I be in the one up position and stimulate my serotonin if I'm in this terrible world that is putting me down? Well, in fact, you're putting yourself down by seeing yourself as the powerless little monkey like I was sitting there in that meeting. Um, so the reality is everyone wants to be special. That's natural and healthy and normal. But you or in a world where 8 billion other people want to be as special as you are. So the equivalent is when you're in kindergarten, one kid gets to be the star of the week, and then the next week, another person gets to be the star of the week. But your mammal brain wants to be the star every minute. So this is not a realistic expectation. So when you understand that, then you understand your own frustration and your own ups and downs. And you don't need to see your ups and downs as, as a problem or even a pathology, but rather this is the way the mammal brain works. It is not designed to release happy chemicals every minute of every day. Uh, I do remember um, some psychological studies from years ago that um, found that people that were uh, mentally, physically, and, and, and just generally healthy all round had a slightly above average um, perception of themselves. So they thought them, themselves a, a little better than they actually were. And that was actually I I healthy. That book, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that was actually healthy. Um, so somehow that's kind of not, not in vogue anymore. You, we're not to think ourselves, um, you know, a little above average. Um, but nevertheless, that was, that was the findings back then. And we, we are seeking to thrive. Uh, and uh, so if you don't, if you don't think, I mean, there's, and there's masses of money being made at the moment by people um, helping us to feel good enough. And, uh, I, and I very often say good enough for what? Just, just first of all, you've got to be good enough for yourself. Uh, and that's a process. And then the outside world's another issue. Um, yeah. I, I loved it once. Who was it? Selma Hayek or someone was saying, she said, when, uh, if, if, you, if someone insults you and you feel really bad and you have all these negative feelings, um, what would it have been if they spoke to you in a, diff, in a foreign language? Um, so... Yeah. So actually, they didn't insult you. You let what they said be an insult. Uh, yes, and exactly. so there's a, there's a lot about what we do uh, that is, and yeah. and as you're saying, we have within us that lovely chapter. Rely on the tools that are always with you, uh, and uh, so we have these capacities. And to some way, is it right to say we have a choice, or is it is it that we we need to set up? frameworks or is it a combination of these changing of habits making choices what, what do you think in a, as as we're moving out of sort of closing in on the end of the talk i think we have a choice but we are challenged to make that choice in every moment and because that's hard and because our brain is so easily um sailing into the neural pathway that was built up in the past that uh, habits are the modern way of uh, freeing yourself from that risk of making a bad choice and making it easier to make the good choice. But I just wanted to say about when you said, um, I can't remember what it was, but the idea of social comparison of, of we want to improve, but what is an improvement that social comparison is endless. So no matter what you do, if you keep comparing yourself to others, then it will not feel good enough. And then you'll blame them for thinking you're not good enough when you're really thinking about it. So you have to know that you're making the social comparison, but it's hard to stop because the animal brain does it constantly. And I'm 
every time period, people have always done it. So when big hats were the style, they got bigger and bigger. When corsets <laughs> were the style, they got tighter and tighter. So every time period has its craziness. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I already feel much more relaxed now that I've, you know, just Richard's always going to be better than me. And that's okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, oh, we're mutual, mutual balance is decided. But it is, it, it is the problem with social. And there's a number of things. I, I, I wrote a book years ago called How the Real World's Driving Us Crazy. And, and the, um, you know, sort of the real world as in, as in this, this social structure. So there's so much uh, for everybody there. Now, we, we probably really have to wind things up now because, you know, we, we know that people, they, they also uh, compare us to their, their watches and they turn us off after a bit. But um, is there anything we've missed or is there just a little summary you'd like to make, a last thing uh, to leave people with uh, uh, or uh, as, we, as we just come to the, the end of the session? Well, we might quickly mention mirror neurons. So you may have heard of this. Mirror neurons activate when you see another individual get a reward or suffer pain. And I think this has been misunderstood with this whole empathy movement. So the purpose of, of mirror neurons is when I see you crack open a nut, then, and I can't crack open my nut, so I watch you and it activates the position, the behaviors that will help me get a reward. So we are all um, wired to more than we realize by the models that we grew up with, both for better and worse, both for happy and unhappy. And when you know that, then you could sort of park yourself in a position where you could be exposed to other people who have the behavior you want to learn and pull yourself away from people with behaviors that are not helping you. Mm, yeah. Okay. And and these are just uh, uh, lie in, in that. What's beautiful about mirror neurons is that they operate uh, before conscious awareness. They're just, they're, yes. they're really uh, fundamentally in there and we, we get it and we, we get the feelings of it. So we are connected and we are engaged and we are able to use these things. That's, uh, uh, thanks. That's great to, to add that in as a, as a part of the package, but there's a hell of a lot more up there going on, hmm. but you've really managed in your book to give people a, a great grab. I think there are a lot of therapists who will have learned some things today, but particularly I think it gives therapists a tool that they can use uh, for, their, for their clients. This, this book is something that they can say uh, for those clients who want to understand this stuff a bit better uh, and don't want to go through the, the, the heavy textbook, that this is a fantastic book for introducing uh, uh, their clients, but also for those therapists who are still working their way up to understanding this, this fabulous but very uh, uh, complex thing roaming around our heads. And just a reminder, this is Habits of a Happy Brain, Retrain Your Brain to Boost Your Serotonin, Dopamine, Oxytocin, and Endorphin Levels. And we will leave a link in the show notes. Loretta, it's been wonderful getting to know you and uh, hearing all about uh, these neurochemicals that uh, rule our lives. And uh, we just look forward to uh, you know talking to you in the future. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Bye for now. 